I think it's the cynicals first. I don't know why he has them. Um, but he, so what's that? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think he's probably like, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's Ken H.E.S. You know, where it's, 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 it's instead of organs, as opposed to the heart. Um, I think it's the choice. Actually. You guys might just say There's still people that didn't respond to that old man. And she wanted to see further. I thought her better, and I fought for like three years. Yeah, and just I wish you had it. I wish you just get the data in there. No. Just because it's so safe. It's so safe. Oh, I'm out. So, go to the rat holder. So, I can just let you go. I don't know if I have one on yet. On me. Maybe I have one on. I just uh, came really put me on, so uh, she can remind you that I'm the new guy in the block. Yeah. 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 That's right. 
Go ahead and uh, get started. Anybody in the room who didn't pick up a copy of the directory last time that we just printed, you're welcome to pick one up. Just print your name so they know you took one so I don't have to mail it to people because uh, we've got a large number we need to mail to people in other states. I just want to minimize the number we're mailing here. Uh, this week is somewhat of a continuation of last week. It was a nice introduction. I thought. Corin did a brilliant job last week, started to tell the story of anti-IL-5 and asthma, and so Matt today is going to sort of extend and talk about uh, anti-IL-5 molecules and the variety of diseases in which we could use it. Um, again, remember you sign in for credit uh, online and the word is uh, eosinophils. So yeah, this is kind of continuation of some stuff from last week and some stuff that I did last year. So I did recycle some slides that may have looked familiar. Um, I've got a little bit of a cough the last couple of weeks, which may or may not be eosinophilic in nature. I'm not sure. Uh, but I brought some cough drops and some anti-IL-5 in case I need it. Um, Oh, and at the end, so uh, David um, has a really interesting patient. Mine may not actually take the full hour, uh, or even if it does, we may go over a bit. David's got a very interesting patient who we should probably treat with anti-IL-5, who uh, we're going to talk about at the end of all this. Um, but anyway, so getting started. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Well, I have a review slide, so I'll show you what I'm going to talk about. But uh, no disclosures. Um, so we're briefly going to review IL-5 and some eosinophil biology. That'll be very brief. We're going to go back and sort of revisit what I talked about last year in one of the brief 20-minute periods, which is hyper eosinophilic syndrome <clears throat> and the proof of e efficacy of anti-IL-5 there. We'll then return to some of the critical roles of eosinophils just in predicting sort of possible outcomes with this drug. And then probably half the time we'll spend on reviewing anti-IL-5 and a variety of other disease states and what's been studied and what is going to be studied in the future. There's a picture of IL-5. This is an eosinophil. I'm sure everybody recognizes them. There are some monoclonal antibodies. Um, so again, just briefly, IL-5 is produced by Th2 cells predominantly, but also mast cells. Um, it plays a critical role in uh, proliferation and maturation of the progenitors, but then also is key for eosinophil survival. And really, that is the primary job, and there's only one other thing that IL-5 does uh, that, that anybody's aware of. It does have some effect on B-cell growth. Uh, it can increase immunoglobulin secretion, um, though that's felt to be a lesser role, and otherwise it's quite specific to eosinophils. Um, currently, there are four targeted therapies that in existence that have been made. Uh, the only one that's been studied in much depth and which, which will be the focus of today's talk is methylizumab, um, which is a humanized monoclonal specific for IL-5. It's an IV drug. It's generally administered every four weeks, although you can, you'll see there can be some variability there. Uh, the second one around was reslizumab, which is very similar, although it's an IgG-4. Uh, it's also IV and administered every four weeks. 
Benralizumab um, is slightly different in that it's to the receptor, the IL-5 alpha receptor. Uh, it's had some study in asthma, it's an IV and subcutaneous, although really there's no reason any of these couldn't in the, in the future become subcutaneous. And then lastly, there's this interesting molecule, which is still very early in uh, its um, exploration, uh, which is an antisense oligonucleotide, again, targeting the receptor, although it has a number of off-target or sort of other receptor effects too, and this is interestingly an inhaled drug, so they're obviously targeting asthma with that. Um, but again, we're going to mostly focus on mepolizumab and talk a little about these others at the end. Uh, so revisiting hyper eosinophilic syndrome, which everybody should know in detail now um, after my talk last year. And what was interesting, I don't actually have these numbers up there, but you know, this is not that rare a condition. I was looking at estimates of epidemiology last night, and it's, it's probably about half as common as hereditary angioedema. Um, the estimates go from about 0.5 to 6 per 100,000. Um, and HAE is about 1 to 10 or so per 100,000. Um, and that's about a quarter as common as something like lupus. So it's definitely out there. You'll, you'll see it at some point if you look for it. Uh, anyway, what it is is a group. Uh, it's not a single disorder. It's really a group of disorders that's basically uh, market overproduction of eosinophils with end organ infiltration and damage. Uh, all you really need to diagnose it are um, a high eosinophil count greater than 1,500 is the sort of arbitrary cutoff that's used. No other etiology, so it is, as with a lot of these sorts of things, kind of a diagnosis of pollution, but not always. Um, and then you need some sign of uh, eosinophil mediated end organ dysfunction. So obviously a lot of things could fit into this. There used to be this criteria that you have to have it for greater than six months. You should really forget that. It's not part of the diagnostic criteria, and given how sick these people can get, you shouldn't wait six months um, to diagnose this. Uh, so there are a couple of variants that are known, um, although most of the causes are still idiopathic uh, or unidentified. Maybe about 10% are felt to be this myeloproliferative variant, which has been found, this was in the last decade, found to be due to the fusion proteins. Um, cause constitutively active tyrosine kinases, either this platelet-derived growth factor alpha or beta usually, fused to this FGFR1. Uh, occasionally, BCR able can be involved, although then you should be thinking about a, a leukemia. Uh, then probably the worst one to have are there are these T-cell clone variants, which, um, you know, it's really sort of pre-malignancy, a T-cell clone that produces high levels of IL-5, um, and people often will go on to a T-cell homo, which is pretty bad. And then there is a report of a familial variant, which has been genetically mapped on this chromosome, but there's more than that, and it's quite rare. Uh, so again, most of the time, you're not going to find a cause. You should look for all of, or at least the first two of these. Um, <clears throat> so differential diagnosis involved, includes a number of things. Obviously, you need to think about malignancies, so eosinophilic leukemia although you're generally going to see immature eosinophils, any pathologist should be able to pick that out. CML, um, although, you know, it can be predominantly eosinophils, so, but there should be increased um, amounts of all of your granulocytes. And then by definition, it has a bcr able fusion protein. Systemic mastocytosis can look like this. It's always listed as something to look for. Of course, there you should have symptoms of mastocytosis and you should have a high tryptase and the hip mutation. Kirk Strauss is probably the most difficult, and um, honestly, uh, I think they're probably in some regard a spectrum uh, and related. I mean, obviously, nobody really knows what causes either of these in the vast majority of cases. Um, classically, Kirk Strauss has this sort of progression of rhinitis asthma, then the lung disease to organ disease, rather, which is often the lung and the sinuses, and then to a vasculitis, whereas HES typically won't have that vasculitic phase. But that can be 20 years into the disease, so you don't really know. Um, the more common things, atopic disease, parasitic disease, drug reactions, which, you know, you should um, certainly think about, and those are some common drugs, but lots of drugs can do it. There are a bunch of conventional treatments, really steroids are the mainstay. Um, Gleevec, which was developed for CML, happens to work for the 10% who have this myeloproliferative variant, but um, that's only a handful. Uh, and then a bunch of other things, most of which are pretty nasty therapeutic drugs that we wanted to dwell on. Um, 
So again, what I'm next going to show are just the studies that basically proved that IL-5 is amazingly effective in hyperesinophilic syndrome, um, and, and talk a little bit about why. Uh, it started back in 04 with this blood paper, which was a pilot study. It was basically four patients with severe and refractory HES. They were on high doses of steroids. Um, they'd all been through a number of things, had a lot of organ damage. And they received one dose. Uh, and what you'll note here is this is a very low dose compared to what we're going to be talking about in the future. Um, two of them responded quite markedly, just with a, a dramatic drop in their eosinophils, these two here. Two of them didn't respond, although again, a single dose and a low dose. Um, two of these were later found to be myeloproliferative variants, which wasn't known about at the time of this study, um, showing that it, and, and I think one of, one of the responders was myeloproliferative, one was not, but showing that those guys can respond as well. This was followed up by a much larger study and really uh, a landmark study, um, which everybody should have some familiarity with because this basically proves the efficacy. It was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. 85 patients um, who did not have the fusion protein, the myeloproliferative variant. Um, they all had a run-in variant, a uh, run-in period during which they were on a good amount of steroids, and then they basically got eight doses of bepolizumab uh, monthly versus placebo, so half and half. You don't really need to see all this. I didn't mean for you to, except uh, if you do want to use this protocol at any point, it basically just shows you how to taper down the steroids. They basically just taper every week based on the eosinophil count. Um, the main thing I want to point out here, which you can barely see is, but here in the treatment arm, there were five withdrawals. Here in the um, placebo arm, over half of the patients withdrew. So the statistics I'm going to show you are really only for those half that didn't withdraw. You take into account that over half of them also fail, uh, it makes the data look even better. Um, so the primary endpoint was reduction of prednisone which we'll talk about later, but was basically why the FDA didn't approve this drug, because they didn't show it as superior to prednisone, which is a little bit silly. Um, they also had secondary endpoints of sustained reduction in eosinophil counts, um, time of treatment failure, and other sort of measures of reduction of prednisone. Um, and uh, yeah. So this is the primary data. Again, sorry, it's hard to see. This is from the New England Journal's website. Uh, but basically, this is the primary endpoint up here, so um, prednisone dose of less than 10. Uh, the vast majority of methalizumab patients reach that primary endpoint, the vast majority of placebo, and this is after dropping out over half of them, um, did not, not the vast majority, but over half of them, plus another half, didn't reach that. Um, down here is just a nice uh, Kaplan-Meier sort of curve showing a separation. This is basically time treatment failure. So again, very few methalizumab fail, whereas the vast majority of placebo do. Um, and then what else? This is just another metric of prednisone uh, difference. Um, they were looking for uh, uh, up to 24 weeks of low-dose prednisone. And then finally, this curve here, you can see the separation, although again, if you consider everybody who, so this is placebo up top and the mean uh, daily dose of prednisone, methalizumab on the bottom, clearly significantly different. And then if you also include all those guys who dropped out, uh, the amount of prednisone they were on when they did drop out, this is more dramatic difference. So it clearly has a profound steroid sparing effect and uh, is quite effective in controlling the disease is the end result of this. Um, this again just sort of shows, this is in their supplementary figure, um, is showing the uh, amounts, or sorry, the eosinophil count in each group. You can see with the mepolizumab, they had a nice sustained low eosinophil count, whereas in the um, placebo group, uh, they were up and down a lot. So they were still on prednisone, remember, they kept trying to force them to taper, and whenever they did, basically, they would flare. Uh, so proof of concept, um, very important paper, um, and it should have really led the FDA to approve the drug. Again, they didn't for a variety of reasons, which the primary authors are very upset about, but we're kind of left with this drug not currently being FDA approved. Um, so they've since published a follow-up that came out in February of this year. It was just an open-label extension of that same trial. Uh, and this was really to monitor for adverse events, and I'll show you that this is generally a very safe drug. Um, they also looked at its steroid sparing effect um, and looked for development 
of antibody against the drug. Um, so they had 78 patients. Uh, so it was everybody who was in that first study. So those who got mepolizumab and the placebo patients who were not, they were then transferred over to mepolizumab. Um, uh, they were uh, monitored up to 300 weeks, a pretty high, pretty long duration on average. And subsequent to this, some of them continued on for up to six years. Uh, the first thing you can see, this was not their primary endpoint, but again, just looking at placebo, those who had previously been on mepolizumab from trial one, continued on it, continued to do very well on photosis of prednisone, continued to maintain on photosis of prednisone. <coughs> Whereas those who had been on placebo were quickly came down on their prednisone, <coughs> showing the efficacy of the drug in that case. Um, again, the primary endpoint they were looking for were adverse events. Um, there were a couple of concerning ones. So there was this sort of acute T-cell leukemia that led to cardiopulmonary failure and death. Uh, although that's not entirely surprising. That was a patient who had a clonal T-cell. And not, you know, not unsurprisingly, the drug doesn't prevent uh, clonal T-cell from progressing. It just prevents what the IL-5 is doing. Um, you had this episode of transverse myelitis, which they thought could potentially be due to the drug, although that's never been reported again in substance of the drug. Um, and then they obviously looked at cancer risk since the eosinophils had been connected with possible cancer for the surveillance. There were two episodes of prostate cancer, but given, you know, the patients they were looking at, I think that's not too far uh, extreme to see in the general population. In this study, Matt, did they have all variants of HES? No, so this was not, they, they excluded anybody with myeloproliferative variant, so anybody with diffusion protein. And the reason for that is those people respond very well to feedback. Uh, and you should just treat it back cheaper and easier. To would, would they respond to this drug? Is yeah, it? almost certainly they would. But it's, again, if you can identify that, you're better off treating them with Klebeck because it's probably just as good. Nobody's compared, obviously, the two drugs head to head. But yeah, they would respond. That's what, you know, again, that blood paper that I showed first, one of those responders had the myeloproliferative variant. And there's no theoretical reason why you wouldn't expect them to respond. But they were excluded from this study. Obviously, the T cell clonal variant was not excluded. Um, but again, this drug is not a, a perfect fix for those guys. Yeah, your data looks pretty good for this drug, and there's no other alternative. So, what was the rationale the FDA gave for not approving it? Well, I had a conversation with Amy Cleon at the NIH who ran the study. She's very upset about it, and, you know, there were a few, there was some back and forth, but in the end, what she said was, um, because they did not show this as being any better than, than prednisone, uh, and prednisone is a cheap, viable option, you know, you can use that. Obviously, if you look at the long-term problems in these patients, you have a lot of long-term problems from chronic prednisone, whereas you don't with mepolizumab, at least theoretically, but they didn't look at that. They didn't really have the ability to do that. Um, you know, she said they wouldn't have designed the trial any differently in retrospect because there's no safe way to do it. You know, she, they basically said you'd have to compare it to nothing um, if you want to show it, if you wanted to sort of pass that, uh, that criteria that the FDA put in place. I, I, I honestly think it's sort of an example of the fa one of the failings of our FDA, how they have sometimes overly rigorous requirements for drug approval, and this happens in a lot of different fields, but that's a whole other discussion. But it was because it wasn't superior to What is the cost for mepolizumab? The cost? Well, there is no cost because it's never been FDA approved. It would, I'm sure it would be very expensive. Right now it's free. You can enroll somebody in the trial that I'll talk about, but I'm sure it'll be quite expensive if it does get approved. So that was the base of the intention to treat analysis that killed the study in terms of efficacy. Is it the patients fell out in the, uh, the placebo arm? But presumably they just they were off prednisone, right? During this, the trial. No, no, they were all on prednisone. Oh, they stayed on. Yeah, so they were all on prednisone, and, and what they looked at in the trial was the ability to taper prednisone. Oh. So even though the placebos couldn't taper prednisone, you could keep them on prednisone. They'd be fine. They'd do just as well as the mepolizumab. Therefore, wasn't superior to prednisone. Was the rationale from the FDA? Yeah. There was one other question that Amy pointed out is that they did not blind the geosinophil count. So the FDA had a problem with that. Uh, that may be 
True, yeah. Because uh, if a patient got sick, the investigator knew what the eosinophil count was, and the FDA didn't like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's an objective measurement from the lab, though. How would you bias that? So we can talk about that later. But so there's another study going on where they're with Amy Cleon with another product that's in, in the works here, and they're having an investigator be the eosinophil count person that's not the one taking care of the patient, so they can alert the investigator, and that's to try to make FDA happier. And again, that seems like a silly requirement, but again, I'm just know. pointing it out. That was another silly thing, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if people have a terrible disease. Yeah, have yeah, there's no treatment for it. Very That's efficacious so. drug. Yeah. It's As you tell you, there's a local patient we had here that uh, compassionate use of this drug is fantastic. Yeah, so I agree with Matt and Tony. I'm just saying there's more silly things yeah. in there than Fair that enough. one thing. Fair enough. Yeah, she, when I discussed with her, she, there were a number of things she sort of mentioned, but that was the one that she focused on. They didn't like the design of the trial, and that was probably part of it, too. Um, there were a few other adverse events. These were not felt to be, the, the previous table were things that they thought might be um, related to the drug. These were ones that Anyway, these were in the text. I forget why they were separated out exactly. But um, so there was a cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Um, these are all just things to note. There was a multiple myeloma. Again, not necessarily unexpected given the patient cohort. Um, an urticarial reaction that they thought might be an infusion reaction. There nothing too severe. A few sort of other immune processes, including RA, ITP. Um, though, again, in basically the numerous years since this and all the patients were on this compassionate use trial there's been no pattern of adverse events that have been seen in this drug uh, so um, other endpoints that they looked at they found they could actually space out the drug to every nine to twelve weeks and at least some patients they saw no neutralizing antibodies um, so just other things to know uh, basically looking at the duration of response um, it was quite good, so 60% were steroid-free for the last at least 12 weeks, uh, um, almost the same for a year. Um, and then, uh, you know, not all people were in it for three years, so they, they looked at, uh, well, that's sort of like 60, but 40% um, being steroid-free for greater than three years. Um, so bottom line, and I'll sort of have a slide like this for each of the diseases we'll look at, is at least in my view, and I think in the view of everybody who's been involved in this work, uh, it's highly, um, it's very safe, it's highly effective, it really should be the first line therapy um, for the non myeloproliferative variant, uh, but the FDA has not allowed that to be the case. Um, so before we go on to the other diseases, because obviously this is a severe life-threatening disease. You wouldn't really be afraid to use an investigational drug, I think. Um, but now we're going to talk about things like EOE and asthma, and, you know, you might be a little more concerned. So just thinking whether or not we need eosinophils. Well, I think the answer to that is quite clear that obviously we do. Uh, eosinophils do a lot of very interesting stuff. You're not meant to be able to read any of this, but they have all sorts of interesting receptors. It's, they have all sorts of uh, interesting functions with other immune cells. So we, of course, need them. But do we really need eosinophils? Um, and here's just some clinical data that, uh, again, Dr. Cleon has collected. Um, and they'll kind of go in increasing levels of strength. So uh, there's this interesting syndrome called Good Syndrome, which people probably have heard of, which is concurrent thymoma and humoral immune deficiency. Uh, a pretty significant proportion of those patients have an absolute absence of eosinophils. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows what's it, what it means. But basically, the patients with Good Syndrome who have no eosinophils have no difference in their sort of clinical phenotype than those who have Good Syndrome. An argument that maybe eosinophils don't really matter in that case. Uh, there have also been four case reports of patients with sort of run-of-the-mill atopic disease who have a complete absence of eosinophils, which you might find curious, uh, thinking that eosinophils are important in the pathology there. Basically, none of these patients have had in follow-up any adverse diseases or adverse problems that anybody would attribute to the eosinopenia, um, again, suggesting maybe they're not important in those patients. There has been a case report of a patient with autoimmune destruction of eosinophils who really had no adverse outcomes as a result of that, 
Um, there are two, J, uh, two strains of genetically engineered mice now, which are completely deficient with eosinophils and have been tested quite rigorously. So they have no problem handling any parasitic infections, really. Uh, there's been no increased susceptibility to malignancy. Um, and uh, they can do all the stuff that you, we thought eosinophils might be important for. They can get allergies, they can get asthma, um, suggesting that maybe we, we don't really need eosinophils. And then uh, also importantly, so with some patients now being treated for up to six years on mepolizumab, there's been no characteristic pattern or sort of set of adverse effects that have been attributed to the therapy or to the lack of eosinophils. But no, there are, haven't been any outbreaks of cancers or you know, parasitic infection or the like. So, um, so I have a proposal as to what we should do. Uh, oh, wait, no, before that, um, do we even want eosinophils? So here are all the problems eosinophils cause. So traditionally, we sort of link them to parasitic defense. Uh, in fact, there are studies showing that a couple of parasites exploit our eosinophils for their life cycle, and that maybe they actually promote uh, the ability of the parasite to live, uh, sort of contrary to what we would think. Um, in asthma and EOE uh, and other conditions, eosinophils are largely responsible for the tissue remodeling, fibrosis, all this stuff that we don't want. You can obviously get asthma and allergy without eosinophils, but you won't get tissue remodeling is the idea. Um, eosinophils are critical for mast cell degranulation. Um, so uh, basically, at least in vitro, uh, uh, mast cells won't degranulate from IgE uh, responding to its antigen um, without uh, essential derived proteins. And then, um, again, they haven't actually been shown to do anything that important in cancer surveillance. So while these things are keeping us in business, I suppose, uh, they're probably not something we really want. And so that leads to my proposal, which I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about, which is just put this in the water supply. Of course, I won't actually talk about that because there is one problem, one really good attribute of eosinophils, which is recently, I think it was in Science, there was a paper showing that eosinophils in adipose tissue are critical to um, metabolism and to weight loss. And given the obesity problems we already have, if everybody were on it, that would probably just be that much worse. Uh, so anyway, we, we obviously do not want to give everybody anti-L5, but let's talk about diseases where it might be reasonable to use it. Uh, so I'm just going to run through um, <coughs> the diseases where it's been tried and then ongoing clinical trials. And we can sort of decide as a group whether or not we, we should try to find a way to use it in these diseases. So I'll start with an easy one to sort of knock over. It was tried pretty early on in atopic dermatitis. Um, there were basically two trials, uh, <laughs> and they picked about 20 patients with pretty severe atopic dermatitis and had 20 placebo. Uh, they got two doses of mepolizumab. Um, they saw, as you would expect, a very marked decline in blood eosinophils, but they saw no improvement uh, in the atopic dermatitis. The same authors followed this up with uh, uh, a trial where they thought it would be easier to see it in a short time course. They basically applied a patch test they knew the patient would respond to and simultaneously gave pepalizumab to see if it could prevent that uh, cutaneous reaction. And the short answer is it did not. Um, so there are no further plans, and I think it's appropriate for, for trying this molecule uh, in atopic dermatitis. And the bottom line is that it's appears to be ineffective and you shouldn't, you shouldn't try to use it off label with that. Um, so next, a disease we see a lot of and where the data is a little murkier, we'll talk about eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, so early data was very promising. So this was um, uh, uh, a study, a phase one, phase two trial that was in Jackie in 06. It was just four patients. Um, they were all adults and they had very severe um, and long-standing EOE, anywhere from a decade to 30 years. Uh, some of these patients had EOE before the entity, before the disease was even recognized. Um, <clears throat> they basically uh, first followed them just on standard treatment, and then this was uh, an open label, obviously, it was just sort of a, uh, a safety study. They gave them three infusions of mepolizumab without any other change in their treatment, and then they re-biopsied them at the end of it. And pretty promising data. First off, they showed a marked decrease in blood eosinophils, which will be a theme in all of these studies. It's very good at doing that. They went from over 400 to 70. 
significant. They um, had a marked decrease in esophageal and eosinophils, which I'll show you in the next slide, which is obviously um, what we're really worried about. And then all of them reported at least some improvement in symptoms, two of them very dramatic improvement. They went from eating you know, only liquid diets to actually being able to eat real food and having less dysphagia. Um, here was the uh, eosophageal eosinophil. So this is number for high-powered field. This is each of the four patients. So before treatment uh, on biopsy, they had a range, as we always see. Some, some biopsies were fine, some were very high, whereas afterwards, basically all of them were very low. And you see the same trend in every patient. Uh, and then here is just a summary statistics looking at all four patients. Um, I'm looking at what does it mean, median and maximal number of eosinophils, and they all dropped off quite dramatically. So this was pretty promising initial data. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been reproduced um, to quite the same degree. Uh, the second study came out four years later in uh, BMJ, and it was basically um, uh, five patients treated with mepolizumab, six placebo patients, um, and they did it a little differently. They basically got two doses spaced a week apart and then were rebiopsied at five-week period. And regardless of what they saw at that point, they then got additional two infusions at the normal Q4 week dosing. Um, and they looked at the primary outcome of decrease in esophageal eosinophils. Um, and then, uh, uh, so this, this is basically the data. Again, it's a little hard. I tried to fit things on the slides here, but the first one looks at blood eosinophils. You can see a very marked decline during the treatment phase in all all the um, treated patients, not in the placebo patient. Looking at um, peak eosinophils in the esophagus, uh, there was a statistically significant drop-off among the five patients treated, uh, which you can see here. This was the five-week biopsy. This was the biopsy at the end. Um, it does look sort of like there's a trend in the placebo group for whatever reason, uh, although that was not significant. Clearly see that sort of dominated by two of these patients. The rest showed no change. And I think it speaks to sort of the, the randomness of our biopsy. Um, and then same thing with the mean number. You saw a pretty good drop, and it was statistically significant in the treated patients, and you did not see it at all in placebo patients. So this was somewhat promising, maybe not as dramatic as the previous study, um, and then led to a larger one. And uh, this one was more of a failure. And one big difference to note was this one was in children. The previous were in adults. So they treated 57, or they picked 57 children, and they treated them either with placebo or one of three doses. So now we're dealing not only with, this would basically be an equivalent to the adult dose we saw in the previous studies, whereas these two are lower. Um, and they got three doses. This included a good number of quite young patients as well as some sort of older young patients. Uh, and you know they, they were not too excited about these results. Um, you can see first off here that the vast majority did not respond. And I should say they were looking at um, uh, peak uh, eosophageal eosinophil counts, but they had pretty strict criteria. They wanted it to be less than five to call it um, a complete responder. And then even for a partial responder, they only allowed up to 20. Whereas in the previous studies, uh, many of them did not get to that low a threshold. They were just looking at initial numbers to numbers after treatment. So first off, a lot of the kids did not respond. And then um, you had very few complete responders, just five and a couple of partial responses. Um, they tried to look at clinical data in a post hoc way to determine if they could predict who was a responder and who was not. And basically, the only thing they found was if you had a lot of baseline eosinophils, then you were more likely to respond. Um, again, I think an important thing here, and we actually had a discussion about this a few weeks ago, these are kids. I think a lot of people feel this disease might be somewhat different in children than in adults. Um, they did do a further analysis that they published a couple of years later. They just took the same biopsy data, and they were playing around with it in the uh, PATH lab. And they did show um, some pretty dramatic changes in other things uh, on biopsies. So they showed a decrease in both mast cells and IL-9 positive cells. Um, and they showed a decrease in these mast cell ESL couplets. And you know, for people who are experts in the pathology of EOE, there's some discussion that maybe 
sort of mast cell eosinophil interaction is important. Um, so maybe this would have been a better metric of efficacy. Uh, and had they looked at that, they may have seen better results. Um, currently, there aren't really other plans of using at least mepolizumab for EOE, at least in the clinical trials registries on the uh, NIH website. Uh, so we're kind of left with that for the time being. Um, my conclusion from it is that I, I think there's clear evidence that mepolizumab is uh, effective for at least a subset of EOE, probably more so in adults than children. And I don't have any patients like this, but if I had one with very severe refractory EOE, who was certainly an adult, I would find a way to get them anti-IL-5. Um, that would be a little thing to do. Um, so if you have any, uh, chat about it. Um, this was an odd study, moving on to another disease, uh, nasal polyposis. I don't know how exactly they got NIH approval for this, but um, you know, it's, it's interesting. They basically took uh, 20 patients um, with severe or recurrent nasal polyposis. This was in the EMT literature, I think. Now, the weird thing about it was they didn't have to actually have to show that any of these patients had eosinophil disease. So they didn't have to have high blood eosinophils. They didn't have to have eosinophils in nasal tissue, um, and they just looked at the polyp reduction score uh, after two doses of mepolizumab. And basically, um, and this was all done by uh, blinded ENT looking at um, by nasal endoscopy. And over here is the result. You can see that at least a, a handful of patients responded and a handful of them not. Um, in the placebo group, uh, they didn't really see a response. So they felt that there were some responders. Maybe those were people who had eosinophil needed disease versus those who did not. It's hard to say. And my bottom line is, I don't know why exactly the study was done. Probably, probably there was good reason, and maybe it works, but I think it requires uh, further investigation. Um, we'll move on to Church Strauss, which I think is another clear example of efficacy of the drug, and not something we see routinely, but I think. At least at the U, we've shared a couple of these patients with rheumatology. I think we should try to do it more so because it does appear to be pretty effective uh, for Church Strauss. So again, Church Strauss can be difficult to distinguish from hyper eosinophilic syndrome, and in my mind, they can be a, sort of an overlap syndrome, and you don't always have to try to distinguish the two. But basically, the first uh, trial in 2010 was just an open-label pilot study. Seven patients who had pretty severe steroid-dependent Church Strauss were treated with four doses of mepolizumab. And this is what every patient looks like. So they just reported each one individually. They had a treatment phase, a washout phase, and safety monitoring phase. Uh, they looked at eosinophil counts um, here in gray, and they looked at steroid doses here. And basically, during the treatment phase and through the washout, every patient, this is obviously one patient, had a marked decline in blood eosinophils, as you'd expect. Every patient tapered down nicely on prednisone. There were some flares here in the washout phase. A uh, flare was basically just asthma. Uh, I think there were two in total. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it was somewhat of a, a, a non-objective. It was the, the clinical um, uh, decision by the, the um, by the physicians how and how much to increase their prednisone. Uh, here's an example of a patient who sort of sailed through it and did very well through the treatment phase and the washout phase. Um, and then during the safety monitoring phase, as the mepolizumab wore off and the EOs went up, they started there and to go back on the height of the prednisone. Um, basically, in summary, all of the seven patients had a very meaningful de decrease in steroid dose, although these numbers I don't think fully do it justice because uh, uh, some of them were relatively low, some were relatively high doses to begin with, but they went from 13 to 4, and then they all went back up, wash out. Uh, exacerbation, so they had two uh, total during treatment, um, and these again were asthma or asthma-like symptoms, whereas they had significantly higher or somewhat higher in the wash out and the mod. They had 14 exacerbations, and again, almost everybody went back up on prednisone. No adverse events. Um, this is just a table summarizing everything I just showed. Basically, you can see the steady decline in prednisone up here at the top, and then it went back up, the washout, 
can see when the exacerbations took place, 2, 4, and 14. Um, they measured a lot of other stuff, which wasn't uh, as relevant. I mean, see the FEP1 did not change, and talk about asthma, see a similar trend. Um, there was another trial. This was just published briefly as a letter, but it looked at uh, 10 patients with Churn Strauss treated each nine infusions. There's a type out and pan out, it said nine weeks, but it was nine infusions. And basically, eight out of 10 responded very well. There were no serious adverse events. They didn't give statistics or, or just further support. This should be further explored in Churn Strauss. So I think at the bottom line, it, it, you know, I mean, this is early data, but it suggests that it's. It, effective as a steroid sparing agent uh, and in controlling asthma and this disease. Um, and I think it should be at least trialed as a, a steroid and immune suppressant sparing agent. I think the real question is, will this have long-term benefit for these patients who usually go on to develop a life-threatening vasculitis, which is eosinophilic in nature, will it prevent that or can it treat that? And nobody's really looked at it yet. Um, asthma, so something we all uh, deal with a lot, and this will be sort of um, piggybacking on what we heard last week. Uh, so I didn't go through all the history. I think people are aware that there were a number of trials early on starting in 2000 that just looked at sort of mild to moderate asthma, all comers, and all of those trials failed. Um, in 2009, and then subsequently there have been now been three big studies it looked at just eosinophilic asthma, where the data is much more promising. So the first one, there were two simultaneous papers in the New England Journal, one from Dr. Nair's group, uh, which is summarized here. Uh, it was 20 adults who all had asthma requiring um, oral prednisone, and they all had to have, you know, they're very good at doing sputum eosinophils there, um, which most centers cannot do, but that's what they use as their enrollment criteria, so greater than 3% of cells in, in do sputum. Um, and then this was another double-blind, placebo, randomized controlled trial, uh, looking at high-dose mepolizumab, 750 dose versus placebo. And they got five doses. Um, they looked at frequency of exacerbations. We heard this with the study that was presented last week. Um, rather than something like FD1, and I think there's good reason to do that, which we can talk about later. They also looked at reduction in prednisone dose. <clears throat> and this uh, figure over here kind of summarizes. So this is basically a, a different way of presenting the data, but this is patients without exacerbation. This is weeks. So two methylizumab had quote unquote exacerbations, although I'll talk about one of those was not a true exacerbation, whereas a placebo group Pretty much everybody had an exacerbation over time. Uh, they summarized that uh, 10 out of 11 patients in placebo went on to it, whereas only one out of nine. The other one that they marked here was a patient who actually withdrew because of dyspnea that was later found to be congestive heart failure after a coronary event. So really only one patient who had an asthma exacerbation during treatment. They also were able to reduce the prednisone quite significantly. Curiously, they could reduce it a fair bit in the placebo group, suggesting they were sort of over-treated, um, but much much more markedly in the Lizumab group and small, for, for a very small number of patients, you know, they did get significance there. Um, so pretty promising. Again, uh, a simultaneous trial from another group. Um, it was slightly larger, 61 patients, sort of same requirements. They were on uh, a good amount of steroid. Uh, and uh, had had exacerbations um, in the previous year, at least two of them. Uh, and they were also randomized, and they were looking at frequency of exacerbations. Um, in the figure, you can see, that, again, over time, here's cumulative number of exacerbations, and here's uh, time they monitored for a year, and there was a pretty uh, significant difference. Uh, the curve separated and remained separated. Um, they found on average 3.2 over the course of a year with placebo and two methylism, which is still a little concerning that they had two exacerbations per year, but uh, regardless, we're dealing with pretty severe asthmatics here and significant change. This then led to the DREAM study, which is what we heard about last week. Um, and this was meant to be sort of building on the previous findings as well as sort of dose finding study to see if we need to use that high of a dose 
Uh, they again looked at severe asthma with eosinophilic inflammation, though had different criteria, which I'll go through in a second. So um, this included some young patients, uh, you know, pediatric patients, um, and also adults. Uh, they all had to have very formal diagnosis of asthma. Uh, they had to have frequent exacerbations to find it was two a year. And then here are the criteria they used for eosinophilic inflammation. So again, a couple of the centers can do sputum eosinophils as with previous trials, but that was a, a minority of patients. They also looked at uh, NO, they looked at the absolute eosinophil count and used a cutoff of just 300, or they could even just have sort of non-objective evidence, which was if you had tapered these guys, uh, their steroids by more than 25%, if they deteriorated, they used that as a sign of eosinophil inflammation. Not sure if that's valid or not, but it's certainly clinically much more, uh, much easier to do. Uh, on a broad scale. Uh, this was something Dr. Kern had pointed out last week. All of these guys were on a ton of inhaled steroids, more than uh, were traditionally used to seeing. Obviously, they couldn't have comorbidities like parasitic infection, uh, smoking. And they basically separated them out into the same high dose, we'll call it, of mepolizumab or two lower doses to see if there was a difference. Um, they all got 13 doses. Uh, they, same thing, were looking at asthma exacerbations, not FEV1, um, but they did look at these other things like FEV1, quality of life, sputum eosinophils as secondary criteria. Um, so the primary endpoint is shown here, and we saw this slide last week, uh, pretty dramatic difference. Blue here is placebo. Uh, all three of the mepolizumab um, arms are down here, uh, and again, we're just looking at uh, with this total number of clinically significant exacerbations, so about the frequency. Um, and we had a lot in the placebo group, uh, and we had half uh, in the treated groups. Uh, all of these reached statistical significance. Um, you know, interestingly, you didn't necessarily see a dose effect. The 750 did do best, although the 75 did better than 250, so it's a little hard to interpret, but I think it suggests that probably any of these doses has the potential to be effective in asthma. Um, they also, as a secondary endpoint, looked at severe exacerbations, so those that required admission, and saw pretty dramatic differences. Um, this was a, a point that was uh, sort of highlighted last week uh, as being potentially more important than this. Uh, Looking at, oh, and then, you know, so there, there's a figure I cut out here that we did see last week, the quality of life. So there was no statistically different um, uh, outcome in terms of quality of life, but I'm actually not, don't find that too concerning. I mean, both placebo and treated groups had an improvement in quality of life. I think it goes, it speaks to the uh, power of the placebo effect more than the lack of efficacy here. I think everybody felt that. Some of them had good reason to feel better. Some of them, it's more of a placebo effect. FEV1, this figure basically just shows there was no difference. Um, uh, and that's really not the metric we're looking at here. And I think we're not unaccustomed to dealing with that. You know, we've dealt with it for a long time with omalizumab. Um, no problem with adverse events and no serious concerning adverse events that, you know, would let them to stop the trial or the like. So again, a, a very positive study. Um, this is just a summary. This came out recently. Uh, these are the seven trials that have now looked at mepolizumab for asthma. These three are the ones we just looked at. The first four were the failed ones, looking at sort of mild to moderate asthma. Um, and again, just using a meta-analysis method, uh, the main points that I took out of this paper were there were no effects on FEV1 here. You can look at a summary, although only some of them had different metrics of FEV1, but however you look at it, there was no change. I just included one of the figures. But with um, uh, mepolizumab on exacerbation rates, uh, meta-analysis level, so including one of the failed trials that was fairly large, there's still a trend and a significant trend towards efficacy. Um, so I think kind of further evidence. So. The bottom line, I think, is that there have now been quite a few studies showing very much similar results and meaningful results of the efficacy 
in reducing frequency and severity of the exacerbations, you know, in this subset of eosinophilic asthma. Uh, I think that these results are on the same magnitude of what we see with omalizumab, about a 50% reduction rate. And we're using omalizumab quite routinely, and I think that hopefully in the near future we'll be using this drug as well. Um, I think the biggest obstacle will still be determining patient selection. Um, you know, sputum eosinophils have kind of been the gold standard in these studies, uh, which most of us can't do. Um, so, you know, finding other appropriate metrics is going to be very important. And then the other big obstacle is that we don't actually have FDA approval. <laughs> but that's minor, a obstacle. minor obstacle. I think we can get around that. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of other diseases that I think should be tried. David's patient may be a good example of this, uh, who, which have not. There's no evidence of, of even case reports. So chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, I don't know who's taking care of it, but it's just an idiopathic disease that is probably some variant of HES or Churd Strauss, uh, where it's basically just eosinophilic interstitial lung disease. And these patients are steroid dependent. They live, but they, have, they can't come off of steroids. There's also an acute variant of the same thing, which is rapidly progressive and often fatal if it's not treated with very high dose steroids. ABPA, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be worth thinking about. Um, the other thing I thought about last night, AIN, interstitial nephritis. We have a patient at the UW with a chronic interstitial nephritis, which nobody can figure out. He's failed all sorts of immunosuppressants. He's got deteriorating renal function. He has eosinophils on every renal biopsy. It would be curious to think about. And then you guys can fill in any other diseases you'd be interested in treating. Um, the good news is uh, that there is actually this ongoing compassionate use trial, and it's pretty liberal in terms of how you can enroll people. Maybe I shouldn't be broadcasting this, but <clears throat> you know, you could think about trying to enroll patients uh, who have so, some sort of severe eosinophilic disease who don't respond to animals. Um, so that's really mepolizumab in summary. I'm going to run through the other IL-5 therapies, not to, not to ignore them, just they're much further behind in terms of uh, where they are in studies. So reslizumab, which is a very similar molecule, uh, they've looked at EOE. They had, um, I didn't put the figure up, but they had pretty good uh, evidence of efficacy somewhere between the trials that I showed you. Um, they looked at... Uh, treated versus placebo groups, and they all, um, uh, they, right, so they had they had a decrease in esophageal eosinophils, as we've seen in others, which was pretty significant, and they had a trend towards symptom improvement, but it was not clinically significant. Um, asthma, um, a similar thing where here they used an outcome of quality of life, rather exacerbation, but not significantly improved. They had a mild improvement in UV1. Hard to say if that was true or not. Um, and that's, that's all that's really been published about that drug. Benralizumab, um, which interestingly has both an IV and a subcutaneous formulation. Uh, they looked at an asthma study where they were looking at airway eosinophils um, and basically showed that it could decrease that uh, in asthma and that it was well tolerated. And then this inhaled drug, they've just done an investigational open-label study of 14 patients with sort of uh, mild allergic asthma. Uh, and they looked at their early and late phase allergen response uh, uh, in terms of bronchial constriction. Um, and they, they showed uh, uh, that it both decreased the responses and improved symptoms. So very early days, but they seem to at least uh, have some proof of efficacy. Um, and that's what's out there. There are not a lot of ongoing trials. Um, uh, you know, I think what I've heard from talking to a number of people who are involved in investigation of these drugs is that right now, especially GSK, which makes mepolizumab, is focusing all their efforts on asthma and trying to get the drug approved for eosinophilic asthma. I've heard estimates of any for from one year to like five years before they think it could be approved. Um, again, the one sort of place where I think you can enroll patients without being at a major center would be this open label continuation of the HES trial. Um, but other than that, we're, we're sort of left waiting. So my summary, uh, and then we can talk about it or, or and see David's case, is that IL-5 
uh, just from a biologic standpoint, is quite specific for eosinophil pathways. Um, again, it does have effect on B cells, although we've not really seen that as a problem. Uh, absence of eosinophils doesn't really seem to be pathologic, uh, either in those sort of interesting experiments of nature or in our experiments with mepolizumab. Um, it's been shown, mepolizumab has been shown to be uh, very much safe um, and well tolerated. It's highly effective for HES. Seems, in my view, effective for Turk Strauss and eosinophil asthma, and then potentially for other diseases such as EOE. Uh, it needs to be approved, and uh, we need to start using it, and hopefully we will soon. Um, the other therapy is hard to say at this point, obviously promising and needs further investigation, but it would be nice to have things like inhaled or subcutaneous drugs with similar efficacy. Uh, so that's an update. That's pretty much what's out there in the literature on, on these drugs. Um, happy to take questions, uh, and happy also to, to see a case from David. I want to ask questions so we can be eight o'clock. You want to take time for David? Is this the case that you saw the other day? We, we can. No, no, it's another case. But I have another question. Yeah. Sure. I think one comment is that when we give some, someone anti IL 5, especially for hyper and Felix syndrome, we just treat a symptom. Because in most of the cases, we still don't know what is the cause. That's so true. Yeah. We need to be more concerned about the treatment or about the underlying disease. And the other thing that I was wondering about. There is a lot of evidence to suggest today that when you get obesity, you, you got t uh, adipose tissue inflammation. So there's a lot of T cell infiltration, CD8 and CD4 cells. And I think that most of the side effects that were described in the long-term studies were autoimmune dis uh, diseases or some phenotypes. One patient died of T cell leukemia, another one has T cell lymphoma, and other autoimmune diseases. So maybe as in fields has some role in suppressing T cell function or controlling that in a way, and we still don't see that. I think to your first point in terms of uh, uh, not knowing the underlying etiology, I mean, we do have a lot of data on the natural history of this disease because we've known about it for decades. And, you know, obviously there's the T cell variants. Uh, those patients are at high risk for malignancy. That's a whole different entity. Um, but for the other ones, uh, you know, these people haven't lived normal lifespans because of their steroid dependence or, or other adverse event, events, but we haven't seen things like transformation of these diseases into malignancies or, or the like in other settings. So I agree, you know, we're treating symptoms, but this is a disease where that may be the only problem with the disease. You know, my guess is probably all of these guys have some sort of, you know, mutated fusion protein in the bone marrow. We just haven't discovered the other 90%. Uh, with the myeloproliferative variant, again, even in suppressing it with Gleevec, we're not seeing those guys transform into CML or the like. So, you know, it may be it may be a random mutation, but not one that then predisposes to further mutations and malignancy. So I'm not sure. I, I definitely think these guys need to be followed up long term. We need to look for that, but I don't think that would be a reason not to treat or to be cautious about treating, um, because again, you have nothing better to do. Uh, in terms of autoimmune phenomena, I don't know exactly what data you're talking about in terms of adipose tissue inflammation. Um, they did, obviously, and they were very much concerned about autoimmune phenomena, but again, in this up to six-year follow-up, this isn't all published, but data that Amy Plan and others are, are collecting, they haven't seen any pattern, like, oh, all of these guys go on to develop these or that, this or that autoimmune disease. Um, and there's not much evidence that eosinophils that I'm aware of are involved in suppression, control of autoimmune sort of processes. I, I think very much valid concerns, but again, I'm, I'm a proponent of using this drug. Matt, when you were talking about the need for eosinophils, whether they need them or not, you made one point that was totally new to me and slipped by quickly. You need eosinophils for mast cells to degranulate. Yeah, I mean, that, is, that, is that real? Is that why well, that's an, it's an in vitro study. That, I mean, th this was it was a paper that uh, again was recently published by all these eosinophil researchers, just looking at all of the clinical or quasi clinical data out there about the importance of eosinophils, and they they cited I didn't look at the an original paper that there have been a number of in vitro studies that you can't just take human mast cells add Ig, add antigen, and have them degranulate, but you actually need eosinophils present. I, 
you may know it better. Bill, your early career was in mast cell biology. Does that sound believable to you? Well, I think, yeah, the mast cell can function by itself. I think the eosinophil has an amplifying role there. Yeah. So that would be the, you need to get a further amplification if you have the eosinophil present. Yeah. I don't think how the, it's unfortunate the studies are um, just looking, because you can measure the eosinophil number, but they may be, the other part of IL-5 is that it activates the eosinophil, so they may be in the tissue there, but they may not be able to degranulate normally, so you've got like in that pediatric ER study, they were modestly declined, but maybe they were totally in the yeah. tissues and, and Outcome factor is really long term looking at fibrotic effects from the central proteins. I agree, and nobody's done those sorts of long term trials yet. You talked about the knockout mice without eosinophils. Are there any experimental freaks of nature, animals or humans that have no eosinophils that have ever been reported? Well, again, there are those couple of case reports of humans, and I don't, I, I didn't look at the source data, but there were those four case reports of people who had atopic disease who were incidentally found to have zero eosinophils. I don't actually know if they got bone marrow biopsies or not. Um, I'm not sure. But they have no eosinophils and they live what appeared to be a healthy, normal life. Um, so those would be sort of experiments of nature. I don't, I'm not aware of, I didn't do a broad literature search, I'm not aware of other examples of lack of yes and adults. And the mice that were knocked out, other than they died of obesity, were they okay with their no yes and adults? They yeah, they were fine and they've been subjected to a rigorous number of tests. They've been infected with every parasite you can think of. They've been infected with you know, other stuff. Um, the obesity, that was just sort of a comical side note. So you only get obese mice if they uh, if they're fed a very high fat diet. If they're fed a normal diet and they have no eosinophils, they do fine. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, from, from those animal experiments, a complete lack of eosinophils seems pretty benign. Um, no, no, you know, I, I don't know the whole history of how things like cancer surveillance got tagged onto eosinophils, but they haven't seen any malignancy in these mice, so. Can I ask a basic science question? Sure. You may have covered it on one of your early slides, and Dr. Corin mentioned it last week. The <clears throat> fully humanized monoclonal antibodies. How do you get the IgE, uh, the, the antigen recognition epitope to come from a human? It sounds like you'd have to have an autoimmune situation. You mean? Um, so, how, how does the pharmaceutical company make it humanized? I, I don't I'm know. Not some, but fully human. Well, fully human, uh, somebody in the room might know this better than I. Um, well, they've got the transgenic mice that yeah. use human antibodies. Oh, yeah. it's, so it's made from mice oh. still. I, yeah. and it was made from mice. It has no mouse protein? Yeah, because yeah. they've um, spliced in the human gene, gene after the deactivated in the mouse. So is it only the mouse can produce a human right. so, uh, I guess the breakthrough there was making a mouse who would not sort of, who was able to do that out of their problems, yeah. So, but the, these are, um, yeah, I, I shouldn't, this is beyond what I know. Because there's humanized and there's fully human, and I'm not, there are slight differences there. And I'm different, sure. Yeah, like, well, we were knocking out fossil lipases, so uh, we couldn't test the, the drug on the mouse phospholipase, so we knocked it out, and then we inserted in the human phospholipase there. So you have a deficient mouse, you first have to knock out the normal immunoglobulins, and then you transplant in the, the genes so that they, when they do an antibody response, all they can do is human IG. So real smart guys in the lab know what they're doing. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much it makes a difference when you humanize or human. I mean, there's human insulin. I mean, right. so well, the, the, the original you can make technique. antibodies to human. Well, the yeah. normalizumab has a small incidence of anaphylaxis, which is that presumably the. Yeah, the first the techniques, they still got like 0.1% mouse yeah. at the uh, FAB site of like normalizumab. But the newer technology, it's totally human. Yeah. These are both humanized. Uh, 
said right. So, but I don't think they've noted that there hasn't been a report of anaphylaxis with these, just a couple of bacterial reactions. Is it easy to measure IL-5 levels? No. So those, most of these studies looked at IL-5 levels, but they're extremely variable. Um, so, yeah, so it's easy to do, but yeah, it doesn't seem to have any significance. That wouldn't pick out who does well with these drugs. If no. So they actually, they've so. looked at that. They've looked at patients with high I, like in the original hyper syndrome ones, they looked at patients with high IL-5. Didn't, didn't correlate at all with really anything. Um, so. Matt, this may seem like a stupid question. Is it sort of intuitive to see how the T-cell clone hyperproducing IL-5 would be responsive to this? What's the mechanism with the fusion protein myeloproliferative form leading to hypereosinophilia? How does that fusion protein lead to the clinical outcome? Um, yeah. Uh, well, the fusion, the idea with the fusion protein is that, so I, I think the answer to that is the fusion protein is in eosinophil precursors. It's constitutionally active. Um, so, uh, you know, you'd think that would lead to eosinophil differentiation and the like. Again, it hasn't been directly trialed in those patients, but presumably you still need IL-5 signaling or some sort of uh, developmental stage or, or uh, proliferation. I'm not, I don't know the basic biology well enough to say for sure. But GMCSF. You might introduce yourself because I don't think anyone knows who you are Hi, or David. your relationship to IL-5. I'm David Gossage. I'm new here to uh, Washington. In my previous life, I was in private practice in academia at Vanderbilt, and I came from uh, Metamune, who made, developed, and I helped develop the Enrolism app. And now I'm here at Gilead Sciences over in Lake Union, and I'm hoping to precept the fellows when I get my license. Um, so basically, GMCSF, there are receptors on eosinophil, so you can have Everybody thinks IL-5 is the only thing that makes the eosinophils happy, but if you have DMCSF around, they can live off of that too. So that's probably why you don't see EOs go to zero when you starve them with anti-IL-5. But benralizumab will make them go to zero in the blood. So does that answer my question? So I think it's, there's other factors besides IL-5. <laughs> We're focused on IL-5, but that's not the, that's a key oh, so I think the fusion protein, 10% 10, 10 of patients, is another mechanism of hyperusinophilia that's through GMCSF? That's another, another possible way that if you give steroids and you give IL-5, you can rescue eosinophils with GMCSF. So my hypothesis is, is if you have eosinophilic asthma with neutrophils, they're more difficult to treat those eosinophilic people, because the neutrophils are giving them an extra survival factor when you're trying to kill them off with steroids. How does the benralizumab differ from the mepolizumab? So does that have an effect on Gen G? No, so the difference between the, the first two, mepolizumab and resolizumab, but they are, they are uh, targeting the IL-5 cytokine itself, whereas benralizumab is targeting the IL-5 receptor alpha chain. Oh, so, and the other thing you need to know is there's an IL-5 receptor on basophils. So benralizumab will knock out eosinophils and basophils, whereas the IL-5 antibodies will not knock out basophils. So GMCSF works through the IL-5 receptor alpha. That's it. On that last point, when I was initially, I remember 30 years ago, there was a case report from Israel. There was a couple family cohorts that were lacking eosinophils and basophils. That was their teenagelogic uh, yeah, yeah, these these patients that I mentioned had no basophil. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I would say is because we're talking about safety is there's a paper with HIV patients who had eosinophils or low eosinophils, and those that had low EOs were at risk for strangulating and parasitic infection. So that would be the only thing that I've seen in literature that makes me anxious. That, that is one of the big concerns. So, you know, if you treat a patient with very high eosinophils with steroids before you rule out strongyloides, they can get terrible disease. 
strongyloids disseminate, they die, it's bad. Um, and so that's obviously a major concern with, with this. And in those mice models, they've given them strongyloids, they do okay, but you really don't know anything about mice. So I would still certainly want to rule that and every other parasitic disease out. Well, if this wasn't enough basic science, David's talking next week on the genes that regulate all the subsets of T cells. And when I gave him the topic, he had to tell me I got it wrong. I told him GATA1, and he told me it was GATA3. And I looked that up, and you're absolutely correct. Um, so that's no, nobody what we'll... will come next week. <laughs> so I don't know. You can have something else to present today. Are you going to present a case, David, or can that wait? Well, people can stick around. David put together some slides. I mean, people should go if they have to go. But uh, a case we've been wanting to talk about. David, do you want to present? Okay. All right. Celebration of the kind of a misleading complaint, but he was referred to evaluation of possible immune dysregulation due to long history of uh, asthma and elevated dose in the field count. So his history was significant for several things. One of them was chronic lung disease. The patient was telling us that he was diagnosed and suffered from asthma for more than 12 years. Um, his symptoms included chronic cough, chest tightness and wheezing, typical asthma symptoms. He suffered gradual worsening over the years um, and was treated with steroids very frequently and basically in the last two years he was almost constantly on steroids, starting at 80 milligrams and then um, he almost always flared um, when the dose was reduced to 20 milligrams. Uh, when we for first uh, saw him, he was already treated with Advir, Zalponex very frequently and nebulizer Bridderol at night. Um, and we were reporting ongoing severe symptoms um, of chronic wheezing, chronic cough, and irritation in daily activity. He also had history of chronic sinus disease uh, with sinus symptoms which started even before the lung disease. He had several sinus surgeries, four sinus surgeries. The first one was almost 10 years ago, and since then he had three more, uh, three other surgeries. He usually gets short benefit from the surgery, and then his symptoms uh, are recurring soon after. Um, when we saw him, he was finding an MSSA infection or colonization, it's difficult to say. Also has history of allergies and he was followed, was seen at the NAC, uh, the last time he was seen was back in 2011. Uh, skin tests were positive to uh, seasonal and perennial allergy, allergens. Um, he had negative skin tests to aspergillus mix, both skin tests on intradermal, um, and so far so but then when we reviewed the history, then there was some change in the course of his disease somewhere in mid-2010. Um, during June of 2010, he was first in by pulmonologist at Evergreen Hospital, and he was uh, complaining about uh, worsening respiratory symptoms and nasal polyposis. He had a sinus CT which showed nasal polyposis, and then he had a chest CT. Um, which wasn't very clear, but was showing discrete opacities um, in several lobes, and it wasn't clear if, that, if they, these were infiltrates or scars. And then he had bronchoscopy and had 57%, which showed 57% eosinophils. I don't have the absolute number, but definitely uh, this is a high percentage. Um, bronchoscopy was negative for aspergillus by PCR uh, or any other uh, infectious agent. Transbronchial biopsy showed non-specific inflammation, and they didn't mention anything about eosinophils in the tissue. Um, additional workup include negative ANCA, ANA, and again, Ig to aspergillus uh, was negative, with a total Ig of around 2,000, uh, 200. I'm sorry, and 
when I checked the NAC records from back, back from 2009, I think, or 2006, the IG level was about uh, around 400. Um, so based on the eosinophil in the bowel, uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonitis was suspected. Uh, Chuck Strauss was unlikely based on negative uh, ANCA. Um, and he was treated with uh, steroids. On his next uh, visit, he was uh, describing uh, improvement in his symptoms and chest x-rays uh, also showed some uh, improvement in findings. Then, uh, early 2011, again, some abnormal finding of chest x-ray. Um, it was assumed that his chronic azophilic pneumonitis uh, already resolved with steroid treatment, and now all we have to treat is asthma exacerbation. Um, early 2011, he tried Zoller and uh, didn't get a significant benefit from that, and then he, lose, uh, he lost his insurance, so he couldn't continue with Zoller. Um, he started immunotherapy in mid-2011 and stopped it after six months, again, for, uh, due to insurance problems. Or with this the UW or not? No. Um, didn't have significant benefit with that. Um, again, uh, so that was less from me earlier. Um, another significant episode in July of 2011, he had some kind of cardiac event, atrial fibrillation, non specific STT changes, troponin was elevated, BNP was elevated, he had a drop in his ejection fraction, which normalized the following day, so we don't know exactly what it was. He had normal PCI and follow up uh, echo almost a year later was basically almost normal. Uh, but that triggered some more uh, investigation, and he had uh, fish performed on peripheral blood. It wasn't on, was not on the, in the bone marrow, uh, but basically all the rearrangement or uh, the mutation were uh, excluded. Did he have a cardiac MRI? No. I not, he didn't have a biopsy. biopsy and no, MRI. No biopsy. No biopsy. No MRI. MRIs are pretty good for mm -hmm. And this is the cheek two deletion. Mm -hmm. Some argue for the fusion between uh, pip one l one and PD GFR8, because that's, kind of, that's right in the middle between these two genes. So that's another marker for fusion. Um, and since then, he was basically on prednisone daily until three weeks prior to his visit when he said actually couldn't take it anymore due to side effect, weight gain, diabetes mellitus, decreased libido, depression, all the symptoms. Uh, family and social history. Family history was negative for immune deficiencies, autoimmunity, or malignancies. Um, social history, I don't know if there's nothing was very uh, alarming. He, has, he was working as, a, as an electrician at many different construction sites, and we don't exactly know what he was exposed to, but he was also reporting a lot of exposure to molds. He was living in a trailer for several years, and that was an issue. He was later at some bizarre tests. Uh, we don't want to talk about it. And on physical exam, he had machinery appearance and was obese. Uh, lungs showed decreased air sounds, uh, mostly in the lower lobes with diffuse wheezing. And these are his pulmonary function tests over the years. Um, I think we can see that he mostly had restrictive lung disease, not that without a significant obstructive pattern most of the time, but there was significant drop in his FEV1 over the years, starting from 84% and dropping down to 36 when we saw. Um, he just had that one DLCO? He had another one after that, um, which was also normal. So that was the first one. That's correct. That correct. Not corrected for normal. For lung body. Um, his labs showed elevated eosinophils, and he only had two tests, so he had 930 early 2013, and almost 2000 in May 2013, and these are these were basically the only two times when he was off steroids. Uh, to all the other times, he had zero eosinophils. Immune workup was normal, except for elevated IgE. ANA was <coughs> mildly positive, homogeneous pattern positive, 1, 2, 80. Uh, tighter and ANCA was negative again. Skin prick test to Aspergillus again negative. Um, pathology report, report from his most recent sinus surgery demonstrated nasal polyp with marked mixed inflammation, including yells in field, but no evidence for uh, vasculitis. So the bottom line was the true trials is less likely. He had a bone marrow biopsy with mildly hypercellular bone marrow. Um, mild increase in eosinophil, 
mild increased number of plasma cell and MCUS was diagnosed based on um, this bone marrow biopsy. Again, Fish was negative for all the common or the related or associated uh, mutation and fusion protein, including CKIT. Uh, so mastocytosis was ruled out as well, and he had normal preptase level. Um, we also performed aspirin challenge test, and that was negative as well. On imaging studies, uh, so the reason that we wanted to get an imaging study because we thought that we might need another biopsy. Uh, so um, basically, we couldn't find anything to suggest that he has chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and that was the major question. He had some collapse in different um, in different lobes or lobules, but nothing significant, nothing more than that. And that was repeated again, and again, the same findings, so no eosinophilic or no evidence for um, infiltration or consolidation. So the patient was referred to immunology, and now he's treated as unconnected through Strauss syndrome, um, and it's treated with rapid steroid, rapid steroid tapering, mostly due to side effects because the plan was to start with high dose steroids and very gradually reduce the dose over a period of two years. Um, tried as a tapering, but couldn't, uh, didn't want to continue with that. A lot of concern for decreased sperm counts, and they, were, they wanted to have another child. And these are his pulmonary uh, function tests since he started the prednisone again. So you can see he had significant improvement only with prednisone. He's currently treated 25 milligrams of prednisone. Um, so what we have here is a 37-year-old male with eosinophilic lung disease, chronic chronic sinusitis, I don't know if we can call it eosinophilic, and chronic pulmonary symptoms, mostly restrictive pattern, history of atrial fibrillation with elevated opening levels and reduced ejection fraction. Um, and peripheral those in the fields when it was off steroids. So he's treated as stroke strokes and cannot tolerate the treatment. The question is, what should be the next step? Again, whole genome sequencing, as we are about to know, six foot elimination diet or anti IL 5 Any other suggestion? We started this with it following a professor's rounds. I don't know who in the room is the professor. <laughs> ah, it's Matt, Matt is professor today. Let's be Bill. <laughs> what about Egyptian Alpha? I think, I think it was mostly shown to be effective in yellow proliferative associated hyperosinophilic syndrome, and we don't have any evidence for that. Well, I treated a patient in a the jury wide that had chronic, we thought it was short strap versus chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and the, it was a nurse student at the University of Tennessee, and uh, the pulmonologist saw the, the young lady and said that she was probably Church Strauss, and then he left the practice, and we shared an office and said, I'm gonna give it to you, you're the immunologist. And so this girl was becoming cushionoid and couldn't tolerate the therapy, and she had her whole life ahead of her. She was like 18, so I didn't know what to do. So I called Jerry, he was still, uh, and. Uh, we decided to do interferon alpha sub Q injections, and I was able to get her off steroids completely, and then wean off the interferon alpha, and she was fixed. It went away. So that's that's kind of complicated. The other one I would wonder about would be cell sap. Might be another treatment that's available to try to see what would happen. I've been able to lower steroids. Trying that night, as you know, I give cyclosporin to everybody. Uh, it should be the water supply. Uh, has that been considered? No, I think um, nobody mentioned that, but I think from the impression I got, I think if he didn't want to be treated with azotyprene, I don't think he would like any other means of pressure. With right? what? With yes, azotyprene, 6 and How old is this guy? 37. Did he try it? Well, I don't know. Are you serious about the first two things? Which no. Which seem totally no, no, no. illogical. It's joking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> he, I mean, he was only on the omelizumab a short time. It was insurance, or there was... He how was long was he? For four months. Four months, and there was no benefit? No, he reported... He, he mentioned that he had exacerbation while he was on treatment. It wasn't very effective, as far as you can tell. So it's four months of treatment, I think we can get some information. Well, to get him on anti-IL-5, he's got to fail or have him tried on three conventional therapies. 
that that would be the only obstacle. You could certainly, I, I think this guy could have Church Strauss, could have my grades in the books, you could have chronic grades in the pneumonia. I think all would respond to anti L5. You have enough clinical criteria to diagnose them as hyperacidemic syndrome and get approved. You just to get compassion to use, you have to fail three drugs, one of which is prednisone. You could probably make an argument for acetaminophen if you tried it and didn't tolerate it. And then you need to try a third. We usually use <coughs> what we've been doing is Glebeck because it's quick and uh, you know it counts. You don't know, expect them to respond. That's sort of a loophole that Dr. Klan exploits a lot. Dr. Mayer too. Um, a maybe more appropriate one to try would be something like Dr. Alpha, which might work, but the side effects are not insignificant. Pretty unpleasant drug, is my understanding. It was okay on this girl's what I'm saying. Is that I think you can do it. It's, you titrate up, get control, pull your steroids down, and then pull the drug off. So she was ready to get off everything. So there was a two win, got off steroids, and then got off interferon alpha with no steroids. So yeah, that's a nice story. I think if this is hyperacidic book syndrome, I, I don't think that's the usual story. I think that when you withdraw the interferon alpha, first off, it usually doesn't have a full effect. That can often they will so, so that would be a really good test, though. If, it, if you do it and you pull it off, you get them off steroids and you pull interferon alpha off, then you know it's not a chronic case and it's like pneumonia yeah. or something. You basically. I think it would be reasonable. I, I don't. I think that's a good idea because if we count as a drug, it doesn't affect you know long term uh, ability to have a kid or something like that. I don't believe. Um, and if it doesn't work, I have another general question. Do you think that we need to treat patients with acroazinophilia without any target uh, organ involvement? Do we need to treat them without organ involvement? Yeah, yes. Prove an organ involvement. I think they need to be watched very closely, and I would have a low threshold to treat. It depends that, what your definition of organ involvement mm -hmm. is, how subtle it can be. Oh. It doesn't have to be like Garrett, who had a myocardial infarction. Well, so how invasive you should be looking for, searching for the organ involvement? Yeah, I think a lot of these people will have lung disease, and then it's relatively mild. I mean, you know, obviously you have to take the patient's life into account for their sort of quality of life. If they has, feel fine. Has this patient had an echo? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, you know, the other thing. So, the most recent echo was, the last one was a year ago, I think, and it. Um, can you argue his cardiac event was well, in some way in a... Mild LVH. But on that same note, cardiac MRI would actually be the way to go. They're pretty good at picking out, you know, it might just look fibrotic now, and they won't be able to tell, but if there is eosinophil, if there are eosinophils in the um, myocardium, they have a, they're pretty good at picking that out, actually. Uh, so, you know, it's an expensive test. I don't know if you can afford it, but um, cardiac MRI would certainly if you know if there's a clear scar pattern consistent with a ischemic event, then that's one thing. Whereas if there's some diffuse signs that there might have been an infiltrative process, I think that's further evidence that this is a hyperdysphagia. Or Church Strauss, you really don't know. And in my book, it doesn't matter. David, did they do a lung biopsy? Or? They had one lung biopsy, and they didn't want to do a beta because they couldn't see anything on CT or a specific place that they take biopsy from. So, transbronchial biopsy showed non specific inflammation, and that's it. That's what I saw. And did they ever follow up on the MGUS, or did they just kind of... We, we just diagnosed, it was oh. just diagnosed now, because we sent protein electrophoresis just in case, and then we had some monoclonal demography, and then he had the vomer biopsy at 5% of plasma cells, and one of your patients, the New England patient, also had MGUS, so right. that's why I don't know if there is an underlying of them, maybe it doesn't sell itself and push it. Well, I mean, IL-5 does influence B cell. Yeah, I remember targeting the B cells. Is there any case reports just to <coughs> get the source of? Of that? I mean, just alternative, you can't have an anti-IL-5. So to give him to target some other took some up? To tweet, what do we want to treat with erythroxamab? I mean, we, we want to treat the plasma cell 
Wir haben gar nichts. Und dann sind wir wieder froh, da hat die Wahl nicht so, ich weiß nicht, wie geht es, ich bin fit von der Duxima. Ja, ich bin nur gespannt, ob es eine Kassel-Fight gibt. Ich weiß nicht, ob es eine Kassel-Fight gibt. Ich weiß nicht, ob es eine Kassel-Fight gibt. War es der Lund-Map sehr gut auf Prenzlau? Ja. Ja. Es war auf Prenzlau, aber ich war nur vier Monate. Trends on field biopsies are often not helpful. <laughs> in fact, in chronic cases of both pneumonia, they don't use them mm -hmm. uh, because they're so non specific. Whereas they will use alveolar lavage because that's a better marker. And if you could get an open lung biopsy, it would be a different story. But okay. There's no way to do that. I'd get a cardiac MRI, I'd think about maybe, maybe in return on part. I would not be afraid to, to try to get a one anti IL5. So when are you gonna see him again? I think we need to decide when I want to see him again. With him. Some other issues. Yes. Currently being followed by pulmonology. He's doing well on treatment. Except for the side effects. I mean, yes, that's their argument. They're saying mm -hmm. take long prednisone yes. might rock the boat. <laughs> yeah, I know. that's I, a terrible argument for any of them. Why? If you have a safe everybody drug. does well on prednisone for a while. Oh. Stick with it. If you quit taking it. Check. Check. I mean, it's a beautiful response. Is that a great response? I mean, if they, they want to call them church drugs, that's fine. Yeah. I'll write that down. Five for church drugs. Okay. I have a. I'm trying, I've done everything I had to get my maintenance. Enough.